not so sharply defined when it comes to hardcore uh, secure electronics, then if the platform is well designed, it can really enable um, to switch um, seamlessly between a ledger and a ledgerless environment. It doesn't necessarily have to be locked into one or the other scenario, and that's the beauty of it. And uh, you know what's funny? I was reading the Australian um, Central Bank paper earlier, and uh, they mentioned an offline uh, device capability only with battery power, meaning <laughs> even mentioning the fact that uh, a recharge would be necessary every once in a while. I'm like, no, it doesn't have to be battery powered. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> That's like five years ago, 10 years ago. <laughs> There's NFC now. <laughs> no, but the truth is that what we've, what we've managed to accomplish is to, to compute uh, all sort of elliptic curve cryptography only with NFC power. And that's what everyone else hasn't figured out yet. And that, that's why it's uh, it's, it's some, um, some technical people are still uh, uh, anchoring to the notion that you need a battery to run uh, ECC because it actually it is difficult to do it with very low power, very difficult on a secure chip. And you can also charge the battery using a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> Australia, yeah, you have long distance. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, that has been done in African charge. countries where or solar uh, power disconnected uh, from the grid. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various ways in which uh, this can be achieved. I mean, and let's wait uh, till more people show up or, you know, a couple of minutes more. Mm -hmm. And I am glad that John has uh, really joined the, uh, you know, the meeting and started debating right from the beginning. <laughs> that, is, that is a wonderful thing. John, you're, uh, you're on mute if you, want, if you are speaking. Yeah, I was going to say that, I'm, I'm, that I find this group quite promising because I get invited into a lot of different um, groups that are sponsored by various, uh, usually commercial interests and so on. And um, and then I get lured in because they, they, I'm told that we're going to get into some real hardcore interest in, in debates and, uh, and topics. And, yeah, and it always ends up being the same thing. It's, um, it's, it ends up just being very high level discussions and trying to bring, perhaps the idea is to bring non-believers into the fold and so on. So this one seems to be a little more hardcore and all, all of us here seem to be, you know, we don't require an awful lot of uh, um, handhold in here. We're ready to jump right into the deep end, which is, which is, which is I think, <laughs> really good. And in fact, um, I would suggest that instead of splitting the, the session in a monologue by me and James plus Q&A, we can just, uh, anyone can just jump in anytime and ask uh, and, uh, and interrupt me. I, I frankly prefer, uh, an interruption than, than having to go through for half an hour. Well, if we have a small enough group, I think that's going to be quite yeah. easy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before we start, I have to do certain uh, things that are required of me by the Hyperledger community, or oh, Hyperledger uh, management, let's say. Uh, one is the fact that uh, we are uh, bound by antitrust policy. Uh, that is obvious uh, in this context. The second is the code of conduct, which uh, says two important things. One is when, even when we disagree, we treat each other with respect. Second is um, that we do not, you know, we properly attribute people and the third, which is actually the, should be the first, is we give space to people to talk if they want to, instead of, you know, being uh, the sole talker on the on the call. Uh, so that fits in nicely with, yeah, you know, the kind of debates that we're going to have. Uh, so without uh, hesitating any further, uh, let's. Uh, dive into it, uh, Sergio. And Sergio, if you look at him, you see that he's hardcore. <laughs> His photograph that I posted up on the uh, presentation uh, looks like, uh, you know, he's a tough guy. <laughs> but he's, no, not. he's not that look tough. I know smile. him really well, Vipin. Huh? But he's, re he's really just a softy. Yes, I know. I can see, see, the, see that in his smile. Anyway, I'm going to keep quiet now 
and uh, Sergio, you, you take it away and, you know, others uh, interrupt when necessary. One of my best friends once described me as a cookie, uh, hard outside, but sweet and soft inside. I don't know. Well, uh, time will tell. Anyway, welcome everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And James uh, is also here with me. I've uh, been helping Tangent for a while as well. Um, I'd like to start this with a, a self-introduction, uh, hopefully not overshadowing the importance of the topic, but uh, to set some context. And I'll start also sharing the deck here. So when did, um, when did the uh, digital money really come into place? And when did FinTech really start is, uh, is a question we should ask ourselves. And uh, we'll see later in the presentation that in the 1870s and 1880s, a lot of things happened, literally 150 years ago. Uh, Western Union started the first transcontinental United States uh, line uh, be, between coast to coast uh, in 1861. Ten years later, they started using the telegraphic line uh, to transport messages about um, money transfer. And uh, that's how telegraphic transfers were born. 150 years of constant iterations and evolution, of course, with uh, more modern, more, uh, more complex, more powerful systems uh, blossomed, obviously, with the uh, Internet. And uh, the fact that uh, all the digital access got uh, democratized all of a sudden uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And uh, then mobile. So we have a lot of iteration. And now we got to the point where um, things are, are speeding up at an exponential pace. And this is such an interesting time, obviously, to, to be witnessing and participating constructively in uh, moving forward. Uh, personally, I've seen a few milestones of this. Um, process happening. Uh, I was born in a family uh, where my dad was a tech entrepreneur, which was not really a common thing to be in Italy in the 80s. Uh, so I witnessed firsthand uh, mobile terminals doing uh, um, over uh, landline uh, communication before modems were even really a word. Um, then in 2003, coincidentally, I was still living in Italy, and um, Hutchinson Wampoa Group launched uh, 3G, so UMTS was called, or CDMA 2100, uh, in Italy. So we were one of the first countries in the world, if not the first, to have um, mainstream uh, video calls between uh, uh, phones. I wouldn't call them smartphone, but they had already a decent experience, really like a FaceTime experience. And this was early. Uh, and then. Um, 2007, at the time, coincidentally, I was living in Korea, and I still vividly remember how I landed uh, in a country where iPhones were barely being launched elsewhere in the world. So that tells you how smartphones were at the time. So basic, barely an internet connection, barely a browser, barely some apps that would be like calculator and, and compass, right, to start with. And in Korea, Almost every phone, feature phone, smartphone, all alike, had uh, NFC capability for um, uh, mobile payments, store value, and account base. Tap, 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 anywhere in the country. So that's where they were, and they were so advanced. No other country, you, maybe uh, Japan only. Mm -hmm. Can you um, tell us what NFC is? Because there may be people who yeah. do not know. Uh, near field uh, communication is. Uh, um, wireless protocol that is based on uh, low energy, uh, high proximity uh, wireless transmission and is used mostly for payment systems. And uh, it's like the Apple Pay uh, and Google Pay uh, and also the, the your credit cards. So this card, all these cards that uh, have, uh, sorry, I shouldn't see my number maybe, on <laughs> this card that have uh, the NFC logo here. Whoop, you can't see it. Anyway, the little four waves. That's a, that's a EMV uh, logo for, um, for NFC. So it's meant for uh, close, um, close proximity transactions. It's called contactless, although usually you just go so close as you almost touch, but it could be technically a few centimeters, uh, a few inches away. 
So in 2007, we were already doing mobile payments in, in Korea. And, uh, and from then on, it has been a landslide of innovation uh, up until today, where I'm very happy to be at the forefront of, um, of this innovation with uh, Tangem. Uh, Tangem was born uh, out of uh, hardcore research and development in uh, secure um, embedded uh, and microsystems. Uh, anything from SIM card inlays uh, to you know more uh, complex uh, solutions, with the result that in 2017, uh, yeah, so 2017, uh, three, four years ago, uh, our founders uh, understood the power of um, blockchains and decided to focus on applications to bring digital assets to mainstream. Now, blockchains, of course, unlocked a lot of um, creative thinking in R&D. Don't necessarily mean that every solution that the world needs or that Tangent provides are based on a blockchain, but it means that uh, the fundamental principles of asymmetric cryptography and how this is used to secure assets and secure property on a blockchain are usable in other contexts too. And this is, this is where Tangent really comes into place. But I'll dive straight in so that we can uh, we can have a better understanding of uh, what we do. And again, please interrupt me anytime. I love to have uh, to to have feedback, and I, I love maybe to explain uh, uh, and break down some certain concepts that may not be obvious to the to the viewers also later for the recording. Central bank digital currency. Uh, this is a beautiful schema, uh, first seen uh, in 2018, made by the Bank of um, International Settlement. It's called the money flower because it looks like a flower and it um, describes through means, by means of a Venn diagram, how different type of uh, uh, applications and different properties of uh, money uh, can be identified. For the purpose of uh, understanding where central bank digital currency really fits. So the gray area is, so the central four squares uh, sectors are uh, where the Bank of International Settlement in 2018 thought the central bank digital currency would be. The lines are blurred in certain cases, so I'm not going to dive uh, into the discussion of whether this is right or wrong, but it is a very good starting point to understand uh, uh, what type of problem we're trying to solve today. And the problem we're trying to solve with Tangem is to make um, central bank digital currency uh, accepted, uh, accessible, inclusive, and secure for everyone. So really bring it to mainstream. Uh, our starting assumption is today we have paper cash can we do better like 10 times better because if we're not improving ux by 10 times we're really not solving a problem we should take this as a um, silicon valley startup uh, uh, with uh, the intention of really dramatically uh, revolutionizing the experience for the better not just iteratively add a little a little bell or a little whistle to the solution and uh, this uh, this chart also uh, brings uh, up a few um, ongoing discussions whether central bank digital currency should be distributed on a one tier or two tier system, whether it's the only the central bank should be involved in the distribution and, and management and, uh, and program management of the currency, or whether there should be also a cooperation uh, by a middle tier of uh, commercial banks that, um, as they do today, help with uh, distribution. Uh, technically, today cash is um, N zero, so the the bank central bank uh, directly redeemable and issued um, currency. But at the same time, um, it is in fact distributed by ATMs from the commercial banks. So you can have the second tier anyway. Uh, very few of us would really, you could, but very few of us could really really do on a daily basis walk up to the central bank to redeem or transact uh, or withdraw cash. Uh, it is though a title of uh, uh, a claim towards the central bank. In that sense, it's uh, M0. And um, another big discussion that has been uh, uh, brought alive by multiple uh, um, uh, players in the industry is whether uh, the right approach is to have a token-based or an account-based uh, solution for 
digital currency issued by the central bank. Uh, this taxonomy is highly debated, and uh, I agree that uh, it's not maybe the proper way to to um, identify the problem. Partly because it is better to call those two solutions uh, ledgerless and ledger based, as written here on the side. Our uh, uh, our view is that uh, in any case. Uh, the central bank needs a ledger to maintain its central uh, its currency. But at the same time, if you want to design a product that is uh, comparable in properties to cash, so it's anonymous, it's peer-to-peer uh, -peer direct and, and can be transferred without um, internet connectivity and other, and other facilities and, and witnesses and, and uh, third parties, then uh, you need the tokens to be uh, secured and verifiable without uh, the presence, immediate presence of a ledger. And so you open not only to the case where the tokens are independent from the ledger, but there's a whole range in between. And this is what we're going to talk about today. How, how does technology help this, uh, this plethora of solutions that are the old gray area between ledger and ledgerless solutions? And this is another table taken from the, uh, the same report, I think, from BIS in 2018. And uh, as you see here, the two columns between token and account-based uh, uh, solutions are very clearly defined. There's, well, there's not a line, but there's in fact a, a, a distinction between them. Uh, what we want to do today is uh, open up your minds and uh, uh, allow you to explain, to think that we can blur those lines. And this is so powerful because uh, at this point, creativity in product design um, cannot, should not be limited and will not be limited by preconceptions of either technical feasibility or uh, uh, dogmatic, uh, dogmatic um, principles like uh, it's your account or token based. So no such thing for us um, because our technology is so powerful, you do it's not Non-binary, in other words. Exactly, it's not binary. With a powerful enough platform, like uh, like the non-binary uh, sort of uh, argument uh, echoed elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we live in a world where where we're starting to accept and understand that uh, that it's not all black and white. Let's put it that way. And uh, so, um, it, with a powerful enough platform, uh, the product design choice is left to um, the, um, to design thinking. And so you'd want to start from how do you want the user experience to be? What are the policies to implement? Monetary and uh, privacy and legal and regulatory. And then walk back to how you want the, the features to be defined and the specifications. You shouldn't start from a dogmatic approach oh, we have to choose whether it's cancer tokens and then uh, deploy the system and trying to force it towards being useful. That's a failure. And look, again, things have accelerated so fast in the last 10, 20 years. And it's beautiful to learn from companies like uh, Facebook, Google, Apple, and I mean, all, all the major tech upstarts that are growing so fast. Why are they growing so fast? Because they are applying these design principles where they first want to solve for a problem. They want to solve for the user case. They want to optimize for usability and then walk back to what kind of platform they need or having a platform flexible enough that allows to A-B test and check and try and iterate quickly. So this is what we need for money as well. The fact that a central bank is a is a, um, a venerable and solid institution doesn't mean it shouldn't move in the same direction. Absolutely, the two things are unrelated, in my opinion. So going back to my initial uh, um, storyline, a lot of things happened in the eighties, and I mean the real eighties, the eighteen eighties. Um, one of the, the most beautiful and my, my favorite uh, stories is the War of, of Currents. Some of you may remember there was also a famous movie a few years ago about uh, Nikola Tesla, Edison, and all the, the bickering about um, alternating current versus uh, direct current. A little background, alternating current is an electric uh, charge that uh, alternates through time and switches polarity. Uh, and direct current is instead the DC 12 volts, like a battery, uh, like this battery is DC. 
it will only provide uh, what is this two or three volts and um, I'm curious now, 1.5 volts, and, um, and will not change. The main difference is that if you want to transfer over a long distance um, electricity uh, with direct current, you'll have a lot of inefficiency that is uh, inversely proportional. Uh, so the efficiency inver inversely proportional to the distance you want to travel. And so the, um, you reach a, a critical ma mass where your system is non-sustainable. Whereas with alternating current, you can transport electricity much further at an incredibly higher um, efficiency. And also with the transformer, which is the second important component of the solution, you can uh, quickly um, convert uh, the, the tension, so the voltages of, the, um, of your current, of your um, electricity uh, in real time and with a very low uh, energy loss. These two factors, the fact that you can transport far and you can convert easily to a lower voltage at, uh, at the distribution point for a local subnetwork, of course, made uh, Tesla's theory of alternating current win commercially over time. Um, today, we're assisting a similar revolution that is a bit more quiet and silent. You know, at the time, Edison was burning horses with electricity in the public square to show how electricity be, would be how alternative current would, with high voltages would be dangerous. Um, and I think you know, they also started um, electrocution to, to demonstrate that. It was it's a bit weird. It got really ugly at some point. It's not that ugly with uh, asymmetric cryptography. Luckily, it's all, uh, it's all um, <laughs> theoretical and on, on, on bytes and bits. But we have found out that uh, the traditional example of Bob and Alice exchanging the messages with a private key and the public key, all that story that is a little too much for today's presentation, but you should absolutely go look it up if you are not aware. Uh, with asymmetric cryptography, you can achieve uh, incredible things on um, uh, securing a digital assets and security uh, digital communication in general. The role we play at Tangem, and I'm coming to the point, is that Tantium is like the transformer for uh, alternating current in 150 years ago. We are that little component that allows asymmetric cryptography to be distributed and made available at the end point for mainstream consumption on a daily basis and in a scalable way. So our technology is based on a very interesting stack that has um, proprietary firmware on a trusted chip platform. We can use EAL6 plus uh, off the shelf chips, which we are doing today. We can use proprietary chips, which we're also using today. We're designing and, and manufacturing our own chips, well, clearly through a fab lab. Um, we can also use Java card with uh, um, our own application. So all this trusted uh, hardware plus um, audited or, or um, Java type of uh, firmware is the core foundation. On top of it, everything is open source. Open source SDKs allow for uh, any developer, any institution, any central bank, any bank, any retailer, any startup in a garage to take our cards and to build a solution that uses the properties of asymmetric cryptography to secure digital assets in a very affordable and, uh, and flexible way. So I uh, think we have already some questions. I don't want to miss them, so I'll open the chat. How does interoperability look like from chips to chips and banks to bank? Yeah, this is exactly where I'm talking about it. So uh, actually, there's a better slide for this, and then I can jump back to, uh, to here. Interoperability is, um, is important for the developers from the SDK up. So once you have an NFC interface and uh, near field communication, and you can just touch a card to, to start a transaction. And I can also demonstrate it here. Probably the screen is going to, to rebel, but if I have a smartphone and I just touch it with a tangent card, the NFC will come alive and uh, a real time verification of the available assets happens and I can uh, therefore afterwards sign transactions. So what we have in the chip here is uh, a fully self-contained key management 
solution. Through NFC commands, which are open source, anyone can ask the chip to generate a new key pair, ask to prove ownership with a challenge response, ask to sign a transaction with a private key, and ask to purge the keys if necessary, or, or it's, it's part of the, the cycle, to terminate the cycle of the key. All of this is self-containing, meaning that the private key never leaves this card. And this is a part where the either an external audit is necessary. We were audited by Kudel's key security. Jean-Pierre Omasson himself audited our, uh, our firmware. Or um, you rely on uh, platforms like Java Card where there's a shift of trust to the, the platform, to the certified platform, and we provide only a smaller part of the app on top and that could be opened. So um, you, you can shift and this shift in trust is very important because what we're really doing here is push trust to the edges. This is another important milestone to, to understand if we want to, to envision the future of money. Blockchains and specifically Bitcoin, but others too, have been fundamental in uh, educating the world about the concept of trust. In the old world, by old I mean 15, 20 years ago, you would have um, trust in institutions or trust in a person. Now you trust a chip and you trust a ledger. And the two don't necessarily have to uh, be open source. You can trust it through an auditor like with a chip, or you can trust it, um, well, in case of Bitcoin, then it's open source and you can trust it to uh, mathematical uh, um, properties. And so this shift of trust makes it possible to disintermediate at will any, anything in between. While Bitcoin is a very, um, um, let's say, extreme view on how the world should work, which one may or may not agree with, but it demonstrated how things can run without um, the traditional banking intermediaries. The truth is that the, the right solution is programmable money, where anything, going back to my product design principle, we should first design the product as serving the people, and then walking back to what the requirements are. And by using a platform that is interoperable and, and flexible and programmable, you can define all those features in the meanwhile. So specifically for um, central bank digital currency, we don't have necessarily to choose between hosted or unhosted wallets. So un un basically to self custody or with a custodial account kept by a financial institution. We don't have to choose between token based and um, account-based or ledger-less or ledger-based. We don't have to. As long as there's enough power in the holder's device, and as long as there's the right, the chain of trust is established by means of the right type of firmware, the right type of audits, the right type of uh, mathematical functions in, of course, asymmetric cryptography, elliptic curve encryption, all of that. And, um, the right type of institution then of course to issue the assets as long as that chain of trust is properly established then it should be a flexible line where we can walk along we can walk along this green line to define what the product properties should be we want central bank digital currency to be completely anonymous like cash completely anonymous uh very private perfect purely token based tangent does that um of course, the firmware has to take more of the trust at the point. Uh, it could be done with a witness or without a witness. It could be done with a trusted terminal, like someone's phone or a kiosk, or it could be done uh, um, by literally passing a card, like a card wallet as a bare instrument. It can be done many ways. There's no limit on how deep you can go in the pure privacy mode. You want a hybrid, you want a hybrid where every week or every so many transaction or every so much value transferred, the wallet has to be synced to a ledger where the tokens are independent but only to a certain extent and then they have to be reconciled to a central ledger. Perfect, then you, uh, you, the, um, you configure 
the, the solution, the product design again, to, so that uh, that is a requirement. You want that to happen only for wallets of a certain size. You want some wallets to give them to certain people to behave more anonymously and other people less anonymously. Everything can be done. Of course, this is dangerous. You can also go in full tracking mode where um, like uh, some, like the biggest country in the world is, uh, is uh, doing with uh, mobile money, which is actually, it's a model that has to be praised because they quickly switched from a uh, uh, very old uh, traditional uh, financial system to the most advanced uh, digital money system in the world, uh, frankly. Um, they use a lot of QR codes. They try not to use NFC too much. There's, of course, protectionist reasons why they're doing that on top of uh, cost reasons. But without getting into the details of, um, of the PRC, the point is that it, it has to be programmable. So there's no reason why um, there's no reason why uh, money should be defined in one specific way. And this concept of programmability is uh, it should be the, the central focal point of central bank digital currency research and pilot projects today, rather than fixating on one solution and see if it works. It should walk the other way around. It should be okay. What what do we need? Okay, let's walk back and design the properties around that. Yeah, in that in that vein, I'll interject a little bit here as I've had a, a little bit of uh, privileged purview into a central bank digital currency project, which, uh, as John, you've actually pointed out, potentially in some of your, your blog posts, may be a misnomer, right? Um, whether or not central bank digital currency is the tool that's being implemented, the retail payment system around it is really what may add the, the greater sense of value for these developing nations, right? Um, and the, the project that I'm talking about specifically here is the, the National Bank of Cambodia's implementation of their retail payment system, uh, which was Lee, uh, on the technology side, at least by my former company, Sor Mitsu, where I was doing uh, some project management and business development and almost moved to Cambodia uh, at the end of last year. But, um, you know, given, given events that have occurred since, uh, gratefully, I did not and, and joined Tangent. But um, one of the things that they're solving for, uh, and we've alluded to this earlier, is the user experience and offline payment capability, given that rural jurisdictions in these countries and, and in these places that need uh, these new banking instruments the most, um, they don't really have a way for people to transact in a traceable way, right? So um, in the case of Cambodia, for instance, that's, it becomes very difficult to collect taxes when 80% of your uh, transactions are done with paper fiat money, right? How, how can you create sound monetary policy and, um, and wean yourself off of reliance of, of the US dollar or foreign countries um, currencies if you don't have any idea what's going on in your own borders, right? Um, so creating stability through economic policy just by being able to monitor transactions uh, is, is one reason why you might want to use this, what we call programmable money that Sergio is referring to, right? Um, but more importantly is, is the user experience and like Sergio said, adapting it to the problem to be solved rather than just trying to fit a DLT ledger uh, on top of a banking system where it doesn't have the same impact, right? So I think when I, when I first saw Tangem cards, it's very striking and unfortunately, it's difficult for us to uh, present the value of it because it is such a physical thing. And when you see it in the real world and you tap it to your phone, you see immediately how simple the user experience is and the fact that it is a zero learning curve where you know, historically with in, in these populations where people may not have had uh, access to a smartphone, understanding the, the ability to tap and uh, and, and sign a transaction to remit payment is, is much more digestible for these people, regardless of the language even. Uh, so it's very valuable from that perspective. And um, one of the beauties of the cards is that they can be physically distributed, not just through banks, but even uh, retail stores. And 
Tangem is doing that already today. So um, say you had uh, a, a place like Cambodia, right, where there's these commercial banks and a two-tiered management system where anybody with a phone number can register for a limited account without even having to do KYC. They could be physically mailed a card without even ha ever having to go to a commercial retail location uh, to be able to have money loaded to their account, right? And whether or not there's an exchange of cash uh, physically for them to, to redeem a, a token or digital asset is a different question. But even just being able to distribute aid in that fashion, as we have seen in the United States, if it's a problem here and we have uh, difficulty issuing checks to you know, 300 million people, um, imagine what it's like in a third world country, right? So the fact that we can physically uh, give a card or sell a card and have it delivered and remotely load value and store value on this card in a simple way where the person doesn't even have to have access to a smartphone to be able to store and spend on any EMV code terminal in the world is, is a real revolution. And, and like Sergio said, a 10x improvement on the user experience and the value that uh, such technology could provide, right? And so um, we could talk a little bit about uh, programmable privacy and in the, in the idea that should the central bank or issuing um, entity desire, you can have a cash-like experience, right? Someone could adjust the balance to the physical note have the receiver verify it in their smartphone and lock that value and physically transfer it to someone, um, which unlocks, like we've alluded to earlier in, in, in the conversation before we started, um, the ability for offline payments and cash-like experiences. And bridging the, the old world and the new, which is the, the, the slide that Sergio has up right here, where we have a closed loop payment system like uh, you know, a DLT network where peer-to-peer -peer transactions require no intermediaries, bridging that with the existing open loop payment um, infrastructure that exists almost everywhere and is ubiquitous and the messaging is standardized, allows the spending of a digital asset uh, immediately so that the accepting merchant can receive local fiat or whatever currency they should receive and that transaction is processed immediately and so the latency in that transaction because of tangents firmware is immediate and super valuable and doesn't necessarily rely on a DLT framework like Sergio said but the value again is in the fact that asymmetric cryptography allows the agency of the card uh, in the user's hand right and the self-contained generation of the keys and ability to sign with that card anywhere in the world, um, regardless of the existing infrastructure, uh, is a huge leap forward. Yeah. Thanks, James. Uh, I think um, you should answer. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, doing that. Uh, John's question because that is uh, surfaces often in various forms. Yeah. So the um, of course the card is NFC. So there's two ways to transact. Either you physically deliver a card, and that is a physical delivery. It's a bare title that passes hands. Second option is to transact and sign a token transfer or some ledger transfer with uh, the card. This signature can be obtained, and this token transfer can be obtained either um, with your own phone or with someone else's phone or with any NFC terminal that uh, implements the, the right SDK. So there's a lot of uh, scenarios where you have either a merchant or a trusted kiosk or some, some other type of uh, witness solutions where neither user really needs their own phone. And this is really designed for the uh, full inclusivity. So the bottom end of the pyramid that does not have a phone or has maybe a feature phone or uh, maybe have a phone but no connectivity. So there's all these uh, gray area scenarios where people don't have a, a, an iPhone or a Google Pixel. And for all those situations, uh, the, um, the, our, our solution can work um, in different ways. And again, what's the product design? From there, we walk back to what are the system requirements. 
you do need a, to tap the card somewhere clearly to, to obtain the signature. And in case you want to transfer completely offline from one card to the other, clearly you will need a, a trusted witness where you tap the first card and then tap the second card uh, to, to execute the transfer. Maybe even tap the first card again. It, it really depends on, again, how deep you want the requirements to, to affect the product or vice versa, how deep you want the product design to affect the requirements. Um, so and, um, let's walk it back to the base case, which is the card is disconnected from the network. Obviously, it is loaded with some money, which means it is uh, taken away from some other place. Let's not say where it is. It's been released to the card, but it is from some authority like the central bank or somebody who's issuing the money. Yep. Now, the card can be then used uh, disconnectedly to yep. transfer money back and forth. Uh, so there are several scenarios. One is the card is lost, of course, that's one. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, you know, somebody finds the card uh, and may be able to use it. Third is, I mean, this is the real scenario, which is yep. basically you've given it money, uh, like John says, $100, now I paid you 25, I, I got the card, $100, I paid Sergio, $25, I paid James, $25, now I'm left with 50, yep. but you got to, uh, some, you know, some place where the uh, money, the, it has to go back to the, um, to the ledger in order to cash it mm -hmm. or transform it into some other form. Negative. <laughs> It doesn't necessarily have to go back to the ledger. That's the whole point. That uh, properly designed, uh, secure solution with no, trusted hardware. No, but remember what I said, which is to transform mm -hmm. it to another form. Like, for example, I don't want the money. Oh, on off ramp, you mean? Uh, okay. I, I, I want it to be in my bank account, deposited. Okay. Okay. So move to another ledger. Okay. So, yeah. so move yes. Move to course. another. Uh, you know, to the place where it came from, sort yeah. of. So the extreme case in all the spectrum of options is the purely offline, purely token-based, purely ledgerless solution, which uses mathematical uh, properties in order to ascertain a, a balance verifiability. So you have a verified balance that is uh, mathematically secured. Uh, shifting the trust arbitrarily between the card itself, a trusted phone or a non-trusted phone or a witness, you, you can do it multiple ways. That, that's what I would not want to really dive in today because it's a it's a 10 hour discussion but the point is that with the right platform you can tune these parameters and have exactly the solution that you want the extreme is that you have a completely ledgerless solution so the tokens are literally transacted from from card to card with a signed and verified balance with various type of pkis and um as you said between when it is the time of retention and you want to exit the system and off ramp to a different type of uh holding account then yes of course then uh, those tokens will be transferred to the to the uh, redeeming party who will then transfer those uh, that balance so onto a lost? traditional type of ledger if the card is lost so those are the other two questions you asked one is if it's lost and the second is um, um, if it's stolen so um, th those measures are seem awkward seem difficult to achieve but are so available already card is lost pin code we call it passphrase because it can be more than four digits. It can be a whole password. But uh, with a password, anyone taking a, a possession uh, illegitimately of a, of a card doesn't have access to the assets. And uh, recoverability, uh, so if I lose it, uh, can be solved with uh, multi-signature uh, wallets or multi-signature schemes. Of course, in a purely anonymous token-based scenario, there's no recoverability for, uh, for misplacing a card. It's like cash by all means. So if you, if you lose your $100 bill, goodbye. The only difference is that with a password or PIN code, that $100 bill could not be used by someone else. So you can definitely uh, reduce the incentive to stealing uh, digital wallets because they, they can't necessarily be used, although they're a bare title. And uh, yeah, removing uh, the incentive is a good deterrent already. But if you, if you look at the uh, patterns, you'll mm -hmm. see that, for example, the regular users who want to spend a little bit of money here and there, that's all and well and good. But once you get into a merchant where, you know, they're, they're accumulating money there, 
and there obviously uh, there is a very great danger that if if they are only having it on the card and they lose it and with private uh, with perfect anonymity then you know they they're gone so so obviously they they are the ones who come to the bank windows every evening yeah. and deposit the yeah. money uh, back so any system like this uh, will have these kind of uh, you know two different kinds of users for example yeah. the one the ones who are selling their services constantly and accumulating cash mm -hmm. uh, and then having to use it well of course they can still just hold on to it and pay for so, other services and so on but once there's yeah. a danger that you know that by losing the card uh, maybe there is another way to recover the money, maybe like you said, you know, because it always comes from a ledger, there is proof that it went into this card. Uh, so all, all the time, this uh, for talking back to the, getting back to the ledger is important for this kind of recoverability. I mean, that's Absolutely. what John was uh, you got it. alluding to. I mean, yes. in a perfect world, you know, where the card is uh, probably embedded inside your head. <laughs> then, unless you lose your head, you don't lose the card. Well, that happens too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> that, <laughs> a little too that's, often. <laughs> that's a little extreme, but uh, <laughs> but you can think of people having multiple cards to uh, get around, uh, you know, uh, limited limits and all kinds of other uh, uh, gaming the system sort of things. And this is yeah. what central bankers really worry about, these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So with the right type of platform, these product considerations are transforming to uh, feature requirements. And as you said, different use cases would require slightly different products, and that's okay. Uh, one solution doesn't exclude the other. That's the interesting part. You, there's no mutually exclusive choice here whether it should be purely cash uh, token based or whether it should be multi-signatory, recoverable, institutional account based. Uh, it could be both at the same time or you could have slightly different product cards and product wallets that serve slightly different scenarios but based on the same system and same architecture. And that's the beauty of here. It's programmable money, right? So. As an, an app doesn't necessarily have to have one feature. An app has multiple features that serve different use cases. And that's exactly how uh, central bank digital currency should be today. And in fact, I, I want to show you a little video which, is, uh, which proves the, the breadth of, the, of what can be achieved with, uh, with a platform like the, the Tangent platform. Before you, before you start that, I have to say that I agree with you completely. Yeah. In fact, my article on digital wallets talks about this very fact that it should be hybrid solution there is no such thing as one size fits all exactly and now you could tell everybody in the whole world that been that tangent does both <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think i have a platform big enough to tell everybody in the whole world well start small so the um, this is a video I, I shot personally a few months ago First, I'm just demonstrating how the traditional uh, balance check works on a tangent card. But most importantly, here it's uh, it's my alter ego in um, Oakland in a Starbucks to prove uh, what uh, universal acceptance and interoperability means. I have loaded a tangent card with 10 USDC, so it's running over the Ethereum network. The keys to that wallet are only in this card and I tap it on a Visa terminal to transact. So what happened here is that we also loaded a um, Visa applet in our um, future breed of cards. And uh, when we tap on a Visa terminal, the transaction flows back all the way to um, Tangem, uh, the digital currency processing system that sits within uh, the confines of uh, uh, issuing bank that has the issues cards. So we're using the Visa network as a rail to transport a crypto transaction. The crypto transaction is peer-to-peer, -peer, is purely self-custody. So there's an account, but it's on ledger because in fact, the keys are in the hand of the user. So it's it's already shifting more towards token than, than an account based. And um, when the, the transaction 
settles on the Ethereum network, Tangemin is unable to pay the acquirer. So the acquirer, the merchant, doesn't even notice a difference between any other traditional bank payment cards. Uh, but what has really happened is that there was a four-party system without a bank account, without a, a depository account. And this is one of the scenarios that uh, proves how the interoperability and uh, the, um, the, the flexibility of a, a card-based solution uh, that puts the foundations on asymmetric cryptography is really limitless. Uh, so yeah, the, the, we're almost done here. I just want to make sure that we understand that uh, the, um, the name of the game here is product design and uh, flexibility of the solution. And then from there, the requirements should, should be defined and uh, the, um, the use cases should be um, understood before there's an attempt to try to throw tokens or throw accounts or throw ledgers in the market. Uh, some central bank digital currency pilots that I, I'm aware of today um, sometimes focus a little too much on one or other aspect they want to prove without really uh, starting to understand what uh, what the uh, mainstream use case would be. Um, so at Tangem, we're, we will be launching actually um, a very interesting multi-sig product for mainstream in uh, about a month time, uh, in actually two months time. So stay tuned. But um, the reason why we have all this line of uh, cryptocurrency cards that are uh, really pretty and you should all go and buy yours uh, on the shop.tangem.com. Uh, the reason why we have these is the, to prove the technology and make sure that we, we know what we're talking about, which is uh, how to make a um, wallet for the future of money mainstream ready. How do we make sure that a government doesn't have to pay more than what they pay today for a $100 bill to issue a wallet for everyone. That's our goal and we're actually getting there. By the way, um, back to that uh, transaction that you did. So what does the merchant get charged? That uh, transaction... We, we, that, you know, we have multiple fees. Uh, so there's mo page. mostly two fees. Well, let's say two or three. three. Interchange fees are usually split between acquire and issue bank and then assessment fees charged by Visa or MasterCard, the PNO, the payment network operator. Um, and then the assessment the fees are usually very little, 0.5%-ish. The interchange fees are the bulk of it and they're mostly in the hands of the issuing bank. As I said here, the, um, there's uh, an accountless system, so there's no depository account, so there's less uh, ownership of this whole um, transaction on the issuing bank. So it really depends who the program operator is. The program operator is the entity that uh, distributes the cards, takes some sort of liability on the on um, on how the uh, the payment system runs, and then delegates or takes in house the the pro payment processing, the issuance, and uh, and uh, the licensing. So the um, the interchange fees in that specific case you see completely depend on the issuing bank that allowed us to demonstrate the solution mm -hmm. in the future where um, program operators or issuing banks decide to use a tangent card based solution for EMV, so for Visa master transactions, then it's up, uh, it's a negotiation between tangent and the bank on how the fees can, the fees can be lowered. And um, so it's, it's purely commercial. There's no reason why there should be uh, there at all, then there's no reason why they should be higher or lower. It's um, purely commercial. Uh, this is uh, Manny from uh, you know, Odyssey Digital. Um, we had actually done a, did a, a prototype uh, CBDC e, uh, project e -color under a Hyperledger. It would be interesting to see how we can you know, test it out with your card because we have the whole infrastructure for CBDC. Uh, mm -hmm. They've done a smartphone application on top. Maybe there's something interesting to explore and see if we can. We'd love to. No. Sergio at tangem.com. Okay. I'd yeah, love to I'm talk to you. One of the, one of the uh, collaborators. Right. Fantastic. So we, we, maybe we could use this in the Hyperledger project and just see if we can. Yeah. 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 We, we don't necessarily offer a solution directly to the central banks just because Tangem, of course, only serves so many layers in the stack. We are a 30 people company with good funding from 
from our amazing investor SBI in Japan. Uh, so we can do a lot of stuff, but we're not going to run the whole show when it comes to a uh, whole architecture for a central bank. So we're very happy to work with system integrators and uh, platform designers and uh, architectures yeah. designers. Yeah, I, mean, I had mentioned too about a different a specific type of API, more like a, I mean, we can take it offline, and, but, that, but that's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting thing to explore uh, for retail CBDC. As part of the overall CBDC, we have done a white paper on that and we have been just circulating amongst you know, our people and we are also getting involved in, um, in the Stanford's uh, Digital Currency Initiative. So mm -hmm. we bring that also as well uh, in front of this uh, small banks. So there are many ways to, uh, to bring together uh, the solution. Sure. Yeah, in the chat you asked about Flutter um, API. You meant probably Flutter SDK yeah. uh, libraries. Yes, we are we're producing them actually. Now we offer native uh, uh, Android and iOS SDKs. We also offer a full uh, documentation of NFC protocol if you want to go hardcore. Uh, we have also uh, opened um, and pub open sourced a Cordova SDK. The, the only those, and we are launching Flutter. Yeah, right. because this way we already have a CBDC uh, integrated into our platform with the Flutter app. So mm. Very yeah. Good. Oh. yeah, yeah, Flutter is coming. Actually, if you, we can even give you early access to the SDK, yeah, if you want, of course. Yeah, we can try. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, I think uh, John's question was on point uh, about the card per, per card price, and James has uh, replied that it can go down to three to four dollars a card at scale. Well, actually, even less. I mean. Three, four card is if you want to buy a few hundred thousand cards, but uh, at a central bank uh, scale, then uh, the order of magnitude we're talking about is that a tangent car is competing against the production of a $100 bill. This is really accessible. When you, you start making millions, then of course, the well, we already had to commit to millions of production just to, in order to get where you are. But uh, when you start going another order of magnitude high, then you can really lower the prices to to the point where it's a no brainer for a, no, no, a few millions, like <laughs> tens of millions. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, it's the goal is to produce 6 billion, world, obviously, but, but at that time it would probably need 7 billion, but uh, <laughs> at this pace. But um, the point is that uh, it, it has to be a no brainer. Why would you produce a banknote where it costs as much or comparable? To, to produce a digital wallet that, uh, that is non counterfeitable that it, that it uh, supports also programmability into it. We, we talked about programmability of using and spending cash, but once it's programmable, then you can tie into it all sort of services like national health insurance, uh, lending, uh, in, uh, like all sort of uh, privately and publicly available services. And in fact, one of the things we're doing today is also working closely with uh, Identity Working Group at Hyperledger and, uh, and also Trust of IP, the Centralized Identity Foundation, because we have uh, uh, adapted our cards to also be a credential wallet for self-sovereign identity. So, you know, different card or even the same card, you can have literally the Central Bank Digital Currency Wallet, your credentials for education, your credentials for uh, uh, driving license, your credentials for social security benefits uh, rights and, and all the medical card with, with private credentials that are not shared if not with institutions. So it's really powerful what you can build once you have a platform that natively can run asymmetric cryptography only with NFC power. No, no need for a battery. No batteries involved. Great. <laughs> not uh, not uh, Australia, mention, but no batteries. Uh, you know, uh, I had worked on a on a crazy project in the '90s called One Card. That was to uh, converge all the cards that you have in your pocket into one card. But it was a little too uh, too advanced for its time. And sure. now it looks like uh, you've brought it to fruition, and I'm so glad to see that. Uh, we, you know. We we actually did it. We we could do it, but you know, uh, since uh, many of the card uh, issuers were uh, sitting on top of the, their 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 uh, networks and they didn't want this kind of a disruption at that time, uh, that was uh, in uh, mid nineties. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to our um, thing here. Um, we are, we are almost at time or maybe a slightly over time. Um, 
Thank you, Sergio, and thank you, James, for uh, showing up. And thank you for the opportunity. Giving us a great uh, overview of your card. Uh, I think many people are not aware of the power of uh, what is there in smart cards. They do not still understand. At that time, when we were doing it in the 90s, smart cards were available in Europe, but here it was all stripes. Um, then it you know, started getting developed, but even now the, the smart cards that we have uh, in our pockets are not fully, the power is not fully being utilized. A um, Couple of things, one is, uh, Oh, Kirti is gone because I, I wanted him to make a small announcement about this um, insurance subgroup that we are starting. And by the way, Sergio, I'm also the chair of the identity working group. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you have some time later on, we can uh, talk about the credentials uh, business uh, in that group uh, later Absolutely. on. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to John, thanks to Money, thanks to David, thanks to Sonia everybody who's on the call, uh, who's left on the call. Uh, and I will post up the video soon, uh, maybe by this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. This thank has you. been thank very you. good. Let's stay Anyone feel free to reach out. Sergio, thanks for the comment. Very happy to talk. <laughs> Bye. 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 -bye.